jealousy, and anger. When we have feelings of jealousy, we should take steps to keep these emotions from leading to sinful anger. Here now is Dr. Gene Getz. We have an incredible accentuated illustration here of jealousy and anger, which actually led them to say they wanted to kill him. That is real jealousy and that is real anger. I mean, this is a very intense situation. But the fact of the matter is, there are levels of jealousy and anger that can lead us to do things that we shouldn't do. And so the principle applies to all levels of jealousy and anger in order to keep our feelings from becoming sinful. Now, anger per se is not sin. Because Paul said, be angry, and in your anger, don't sin. It's an emotion that we all have. But we're not to sin in the process. Let's look at Genesis uh, chapter 37 where we see this happening. Then they took him, they threw him into the pit. This was the prelude to really destroying him. Fortunately there wasn't any water in it and he didn't drown. But later we read that they took him out of the pit. One of his brothers decided to do that because he felt it was a better deal and he didn't want to uh, have to go back and tell his dad they killed him. So. They sold him to the Midianite traders. And when we read in Genesis 37, 28, when the Midianite traders passed by, they pulled Joseph out of the pit. And they sold him for 20 pieces of silver to the Ishmaelites who took Joseph to Egypt. And then we read in verses 31, 32, and this, this is probably one of the most insensitive things they could ever do and I think even Lloyd Webber picked up on this and accentuated it with hyperbole to get across their insensitivity to their father when they came back and told him a lie and what happened to their son. We read, So they took Joseph's robe, they slaughtered a young goat, they dipped the robe in its blood, they sent the robe of many colors to their father, and they said, We found this, examine it, is your son's robe or not? In other words, the father concluded that he was killed by a wild animal. And Jacob bore that burden for many years until he discovered the truth. He mourned, I mean the mourning that he had. Now obviously his intense love for Joseph only intensified the mourning. In some respects he probably paid the result of his favoritism with the results of intense mourning. But the fact is, any father would have mourned over this situation. And we see the insensitivity of these, these brothers to their own father. But you know, this kind of thing can happen to even the greatest people that God has ever used. One of them was the Apostle Paul. Acts 26, Luke records a conversation of Paul as he shared this. He said, I locked up many of the saints in prison. This is Paul, before he became a believer. Since I had received authority for that from the chief priests, and when they were put to death, and by the way, I think one of the things in Saul's younger days is a young man around 30 years of age, 30 plus, he was about the same age as Jesus. When the chief priests really gave him the permission, he was out there to prove who he was as a young, uh, probably member of that Sanhedrin. When I received authority for that from the chief priests, and when they were put to death, put to death, it wasn't just Stephen. There were other believers. When they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And in all the synagogues, I often tried to make them blaspheme by punishing them. Being greatly enraged at them, I even pursued them to foreign cities. Not only Damascus, but other foreign cities. These are details that are not recorded in terms of the specifics there. But that was the kind of man that, that Paul was. And yet, God got a hold of his heart and changed him. Changed him. And he wrote these words, Do not be conquered by evil, but conquer evil with good. I, I've mentioned the experience that I had going into a Texas prison and talking to a man who was reared in the ghetto who became, they called him Big D. His name was Alonzo Dixon, and he could bench 520 pounds. 
And to him, death was nothing to create death in the life of somebody else. And there in prison, he met Jesus. And as I interviewed him, I was talking to a gentle giant. And I asked him the greatest lesson that he ever learned while he was in prison. He said, with tears in his voice, humility. I learned to be humble. Paul learned to be humble. And he wrote and he said, Don't be conquered by evil, but conquer evil with good. This is what Jesus Christ can do in a person's life when we turn our lives over to Him. And so the question, what specific actions have you found to be effective in overcoming feelings of jealousy and anger? Well, one thing that uh, has, I think, been very, very helpful, at least in my life, as I've tried to practice it, comes from a principle in Proverbs. Proverbs, uh, principle 27. In order to keep anger from being sinful, we must more and more develop our knowledge and understanding of ourselves and others. Perception and understanding is very, very important in controlling temper. Uh, Proverbs 14.29 addresses this. A patient person shows great understanding. And what creates patience? Understanding. But a quick-tempered one promotes foolishness. What kind of understanding can we get to control our temper? One thing is, somebody else's behavior can remind ourselves of what we were once like. Because we did the same thing. But understanding why a person is angry. I remember a guy calling me one day on the phone. A young man, a Dow Seminary student, he was mad. Mad at me, mad at the professors, mad at the elders. And he was making all kinds of accusations. And as I stood there that Sunday afternoon, I wanted to yell back. But I said to myself, this man has some real serious issues that he's dealing with that he would be that vulnerable to call me on the phone and tell me these things. And so I listened, got control, and said, we need to get together tomorrow and talk. We did. Found out all the stuff that was going on in his life. Uh, the problems he was facing with his studies. He was fired from his job. Nothing he told me, but it all created it. And I told him at the end of about an hour, I said, if you had told me those things yesterday, you would have made it easier for me and easier for yourself. And he smiled through tears and he said, I, I know, but you're the first person that's ever told me uh, these things and love me enough to tell me these things. Those were his exact words. And he said that later on another occasion. You love me enough to tell me what was wrong with me. Now, when he first did that, the only thing that kept me from really reacting, defending my fellow professors, my fellow elders, and myself, was to try to understand where he was coming from. And I found this to be very helpful. It doesn't always work in the sense of getting a hold of that concept as quickly as you can. But if you have that in your mind, it's a very, very important principle. Another verse, 1727, uh, Proverbs 1727. The intelligent person restrains his words. And one who keeps a cool head is a man of understanding. Isn't that a powerful proverb? In those situations where you keep a cool head relates to understanding, to perception. So those are some wonderful verses that help us in practicing this principle. Let me read it again. When we have feelings of jealousy and anger, we should take steps to keep these emotions from leading to sinful actions.